You are listening to the Pencil and Paper Podcast Network. Beyond their false paradise. Something's coming! Was a beautiful and cruel world. Oh, that's the pen Norman left us. Uh huh. We'll use it and let Mr. Minerva be our guide. And a deep forest hiding a secret. This way. Krona did say there were other humans in the outside world. Hold on! We don't know you! Funny. I didn't know demons went around saving humans. <gasps> you are demons, right? You and the big guy here? Demons. <laughs> Long time since I've been called that. Emma! Open up again! It's over. Give up. Where are the others? You said you made food, did you? You guys are too late. They're dead. I'm the only one left. What's wrong with these two? They look pale. You escaped from that farm. You've had a rough journey. This world is out to kill them, but they refuse to give up. I swear I'll live to protect our family. You might have to kill to protect someone, your family, or yourself. I didn't think freedom could be so wonderful. And so terrifying. The Promised Neverland, Season 2. Hello everyone and welcome back to Inspired by a Weeaboo. I'm your host Katrina and with me is my husband Steven. Hello. We just finished episode 1 through 6 of season 2 of The Promised Neverland. The dreaded season <clears throat> that you know <laughs> I talk so much crap about. But I will say the first six episodes are really good. <laughs> So, Stephen, what did you think? Well, that's what I was going to start with because I have yet to understand what the problem is. Mm -hmm. Now, I tried to do a little research without going too deep because I don't want to know what, <clears throat> what happens. Mm -hmm. So, I was trying to find, like from where we ended at episode six, mm -hmm. which by the way, I do want to mention this. I do. I did find out that <laughs> the next episode will be uh, stretched ever so slightly, mm -hmm. ever so slightly, because I think there is an extra episode within this season. So it's not just 12. It, I think it's 13. Mm. So we'll have an extra episode for next, for the next, you understand what I mean? <laughs> But based on everything you were saying, I was curious why you had a problem. And I do understand elements of it because mm -hmm. they did do a bit of time jumping. Mm -hmm. But if there was more context to the matter, which again, I'm sure is in the manga, and I even did start looking for the manga <laughs> this past week because I was curious if there was, like, I want to know the context of what I'm missing because mm -hmm. for people to be this upset mm -hmm. that this season felt rushed, mm -hmm. there had to be details that I'm missing. So as someone who doesn't, under, who doesn't know the manga, doesn't understand what's going on, if I just saw this as it was... Mm -hmm. I was like, all right, well, you're kind of pushing through a little bit, but maybe it's not that interesting. Maybe it's not that important. So no I big deal. I definitely know you will understand what I mean by it being rushed by the end. Okay. 100%. Because I know from what 
I talked with my sister about it. Um, if I'm not mistaken, she said that there is like so much more information about the demons, about like their hi hierarchy and just everything. You get so much more explained in the books than they ever explain in this. So, and there's like one episode in particular where it was just kind of a what the fuck happened. Like, I had to have Kimberly explain it to me because it's like we went from this thing and then all of a sudden we're jumping over here into this thing and then it's like it's ending. <laughs> sure. And maybe I'm just misremembering it some. I'm not sure, but I'm definitely excited to watch the rest of them to give it a re-evaluation, but I just remember being very, like, confused and as to how everything played out because there's so much more information that we don't ever get and so much goes unexplained. Like, that was one of the details that I remember reading when it came to the bunker situation mm -hmm. where they were in the bunker because I even took note when they got there... Mm -hmm. I think it was 2046, and then when they started showing them working through the, uh, like, trying to set up everything, trying to get started and working yeah. and everything, you saw them working on a calendar, and it said 2047, and I was like, when the fuck did we make this year jump? Because mm -hmm. it was, unless you're paying attention, you would have never noticed. But I noticed the date on the calendar said 2047, and I was like, I'm sure we were in 2046 when we started. Yeah. So we just took a massive jump for a year, and we don't even know where that jump came. And that's the messed up part is because that's before they even do the actual time jump because they state once they get to uh, the ruins of that temple. Mm-hmm. They make the comment that they've been gone for a year. Hmm. And it's up to that point that they've been gone for a year. And they had been outside of the bunker for like, I think like six months or something like that. Running yeah. and all that kind of shit. So I don't know if it was like a misprint or if that's one of those things that just never got explained. Because we know that, which we find out in uh, these episodes... That they are not in the human earth. <laughs> well, that's what I was even going to mention is because when, like I said, when I was looking all this stuff up, mm -hmm. someone had mentioned in like, I think it was a Reddit thread or something like that, where they said, I don't like what they're doing here because they rushed through all this bunker stuff. Mm -hmm. So that made me think, oh, so there's a lot more to this Apparently, stuff yeah. that happened in the bunker. And that made me kind of worry that whatever context there is in the bunker, like whatever happened in the bunker can inform a lot of what's going on later on. But I, I have to understand what's actually happening down there because what we saw was just them living their best life until... See, not just that. Because there was that one scene where the younger kids are searching the rooms and everything. And then they find that one room where it's got bunk beds. And all across the wall, it's writing help, help, help. And all these, like, distressing ass messages. And they never fucking explain it. Okay, see, that's some details I would like to know. So why even throw that in there if you're not going to explain it? Exactly, because <laughs> when I first saw that, I was like, oh my god, this bunker is a trap. Like, yeah. they know this is where the children are going, and they're going to trap them there. Or, I think my other hypothesis was that, like, kids escaped, and they got stuck there, and they couldn't find a way out, or they were too scared to get out, and then they were just going to find, like, their dead fucking body somewhere. But you don't. Mm -hmm. Like, you never find any type of dead people, and you definitely see where... um because I know they point out how there was like a cup and some biscuits in the um, room with all the TVs. Right. The, I guess, security room or whatever. And they make the note that somebody has been here. Well, was it that person who we are assuming was uh, Mr. Minerva? Sure. Is he the one that wrote all that all over the wall? 
But then when you find out more, a little more about Mr. Minerva and the fact that he was, you know, working with the demons, but trying to help these children and that he's been dead for however fucking long, then it doesn't make sense that it was him. Sure. So then you're thinking like, well, did he have children down here? Is this where they first started those experiments that you hear about later when you get to see a certain someone? <laughs> and and it doesn't make any sense in regards to the... We, we never see the people who are hunting them, the demons, and even their minions, which are humans. Yes. We never get any kind of context as... Like, to our understanding, they found out about this bunker because of uh, Ray scratching his name on a tree or scratching the, the, coordinates, the coordinates on a tree mm -hmm. and saying, meet me here. And it's like you but, said, that doesn't make any sense because so if no one knew where this bunker was, why in the shit would there be help signs written all over the walls? Well, and see, that's the other thing, because apparently... At least one other per person is confirmed of knowing where the bunker was. And that's one of the guards who was in the tunnel. That's true. Because yeah, as the yeah, kids yeah. were running, he, the one little boy was like, how did you find both of our exits? And he was like, where do you think I grew up? Or some shit like that. And you're kind of like, oh, wait a second. So were you one of the children who escaped? And then all of a sudden you turn and now you're fucking hunting other children sure or was this like an entire fucking training facility for humans like yeah. you never get that shit explained man it really it really does kind of pose a lot of questions because i mean even even where we are right now like I, again i have not seen the last half of this but based on what we see if, n if certain of these questions are not explained mm-hmm then I'm I'm in the dark. Like, why even put it in there? Exactly. Because, especially that scene, I didn't even know that, and I actually forgot about it. But if that never comes up again, <laughs> then why even show it? Because, yeah, that, that raised a huge red flag. The moment you see it, you're like, oh, oh, shit. Yeah, and like, the kids never even tell the other children. Like, the young ones never tell the older ones, hey, we found this creepy-ass room with a bunch of writing on the wall that, you know, is very distressing. It yeah. looks like a murder room. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like somebody was locked in there for forever. <laughs> yeah. And so it it raised a lot of questions. So I was kind of hoping we would get some answers. And from the sounds of things, again, like you said. From what like I you remember, you do not get any answers as far as more about that bunker. Sure. So we'll kind of break down what we've seen this far and we'll get around to it because I know we're kind of bouncing. Also, if this episode is filled with gaps and lip smacks and all these things, it's because <laughs> I had very limited time to edit. So just bear with me. I will we'll try our best not to go as much as we can, but I can't guarantee you shit. Yeah. You'll hear my vape, but that's okay. <laughs> all these things, but we're trying this. So... As we ended the last episode, we see uh, all the kids getting away. But, of course, yes. the forest in which they're running in <laughs> is filled with demons. And uh, I will admit this. When this started, uh -huh. and you see that big demon chasing them, yeah, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I didn't know how to contextualize that. By the end of just these six episodes... Mm -hmm. We got some contextualization to mm -hmm. understand why that demon was big and massive and just mm -hmm. some brainless creature just stomping through the forest. And I was so glad to understand that because I was getting very confused because when we had more demons who were more strategic, yes. <laughs> I guess, and smart... More human. More human. Yeah, that, that's a better way to put it. We're coming after the kids. You saw the ones that were kind of standing upright, had weapons and clothes and yep. whatnot. But then you also had ones that were 
kind of animal-like. Yeah, like dogs or horses. Very, very dog-like with a few horses, but very, I mean, there were a few more dogs, I guess, than horses. Yeah. And that confused me because it was like, all right, so. Because they can also talk. Yeah, yeah. They could very, very much talk and communicate what was going on Mm -hmm. in the situation. So that confused me even further because I was like, so what are these things, you know, mm-hmm. because they take so many different shapes and sizes. It just, it got really confusing, but they did explain it. And I, I'm so glad they did because I was really getting confused. But as they run away, they are, like we said, they, they kind of get confronted by the people that are hunting them, or the demons that are hunting them. Mm-hmm. And it's like a hunting party with spears and dogs and what have you. And, Eventually, they try to split up the kids, Mm -hmm. and Ray tries to get them to follow him, and that way allows the rest of them to get away. And as I mentioned, he scrawls some shit on a tree, but as he does that, he starts to run, Mm -hmm. and he gets kind of cornered until he is then whisked away on horseback by who we would assume... Would have been human, Mm -hmm. but winds up being a demon. Mm -hmm. And he is apparently a demon who follows a certain, uh, what did you say, religious uh, followings or religious teachings. The other demons still have like a religious aspect, but these two particular demons, um, I think their religion or whatever that they talk to the children about is just, they're like the only two. (laughs) Like you don't really, I don't ever think you meet another demon that acts that way. But they they (laughs) explain how they have kind of a religious belief that humans are not to be consumed. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to do that. We'll explain more about that as it goes on because it's not as clear cut and dry as that. Yes. But that it, was kind of how they explained it. Mm-hmm. And it was, I can't remember his name. Do you remember his name right offhand? Oh, I do not. I was uh, going to say there are two of them. There yeah. is a male demon and a female demon. And the female demon looks like a child. But if I remember correctly, she definitely Sanju. is not a child. <laughs> Sanju and Mijuka. Yeah. Uh, Mujika is the one I could remember Mujika. because I felt like her name sounded very much like something I've been learning here lately. <laughs> but uh, Sanju is the one I couldn't remember. But he's the one who kind of rode in like a a white knight yeah. and saved Ray. And you can kind of see where the other demons were a little like rattled by like, what the shit, you know? But yeah. they didn't kind of focus on it too much and sanju brings them to his little hideout underground well brings ray brings ray to his little hideout and then they eventually meet up with mujika right well mujika um as the other children are running with emma emma starts getting very fatigued because she you know lopped her freaking ear off sure so she's had blood loss. She's been trying to, you know, she literally had to pick up one of the little kid, uh, Jemima, mm-hmm. <laughs> wasn't that her name? Yep. <laughs> had to pick up her and run with her. And, uh, which I think is awesome because that's one of the things that, um, Krona pointed out in the episode where they were playing tag when Emma was running with the kids and she's like, ah, you know, running with smaller children, you know, Talking about how it's uh, heroic or whatever. Mm. She's like, but you're going to wear yourself out and it makes yourself slower and all this kind of stuff. And by God, Emma proved her ass wrong because she grabs that child and she hauls ass. She does. (laughs) I give it to Emma. She's freaking amazing. She's an amazing character. Mm. Anyway, it basically catches up with her and she passes out. So while uh, Dawn and... Gilda, Gil- yeah. Gilda, Gilda, Gilda. Um, while they're kind of panicking for a second, you see, uh, good lord, Mujika, Mujika. Thank you. You see Mujika kind of standing in this little field that's you know lit up, and she's like, you know, come this way, 
and obviously it just looks like a girl standing Mm. there like a human girl standing there and that's how the rest of the kids get there is because they follow Mujika but um Emma is still passed out when Ray regains consciousness and they are in like this little cave system and he kind of walks off looking you know to see where he's at and he comes across Emma And, of course, once Emma wakes up, they go off to find the other children. And that's where they actually meet both Mujika and uh, Sanju. Sanju. And when Ray calls Mujika and Sanju out for being demons. Well, Mujika first and then Sanju kind of creeps in and, And you know, kind of scares him a little bit. (laughs) That's where he tries to explain their religious beliefs or what have you means that they can't eat humans and that's not their way and so on so you get a sense that perhaps they are unique and this Mm -hmm. this really kind of changes your dynamic a little bit because Mm -hmm. you're just like from season one all we knew was demons bad Mm -hmm. they eat humans and now you have two who aren't who seemingly are not that way so, and they're very different looking than the other ones. Yeah. Because they don't have the eyes mm-hmm. like you see the other ones. Right. But they do almost have like this, it almost looks like a f- mask. Mm-hmm. But I'm not honestly sure if it's like a mask or if that's just their face. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure about how the whole mask thing works because it just... Because you kind of get to see... um their face change, well, his face change sure. towards the end of, you know, one particular episode. But it's still not like his entire face change. It's just kind of his mouth gets more demon-esque-y. Mm. <laughs> but Ray and Emma sit down with Sanju to mm-hmm. discuss everything, try and understand what's going on. Yep. And Sanju breaks it down. Because they're like, hey, this is, you know, we found these clues and we found all this. So this has only been going on for 30 years, right? And he's like, oh, no, 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 (laughs) no, 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 no. Clearly, children, you have no idea what's going on. This has been going on for a thousand years. And you're like, what, what, what? A thousand? Yep. And yeah, I'll agree. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. So... Because we only had... And that's just the first bombshell. (laughs) Yeah, that was contextualized based on the information that we had. Mm -hmm. So he just broke that barrier. No, no, no. It's been a thousand years. Mm -hmm. We've been here. There's been a whole war going on. Mm -hmm. And then not only that, but eventually there was an agreement, if you will, between the demons and the humans Mm -hmm. where demons live over here, humans live over there, but... (laughs) Uh, human or demons need humans to live. So we're going to use some over here and we're going to breed them Mm -hmm. so we can feed them. But the rest of you are fine. You know, you can live over here peacefully, fine. You ain't got to worry about nothing, but we're still going to farm humans over here. But that's the thing. It was a deal between the humans and the Uh, demons. The humans volunteered to leave some of their people behind to be bred and eaten. And it's fucked up. <laughs> it's really fucked up when especially when you find out more about the demons and how their entire bodily like functions work. Like the humans could have just, you know, built a big fucking wall, kept them out and then the demons would have just died off anyway. We're going to build a wall. It's going to be great. <laughs> it's going to we're going to keep out all the demons. The demons are never going to get in here. We're going it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> You just have no idea how great this wall is going to be. Oh, Jesus. Anyway. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. you, that was not what I was expecting. Yeah. I will say that was kind of a shocker. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, because at first Ray was like, oh, so we're not on Earth. And he was like, no, this is Earth. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, so it's not the year 2045. He's like, yeah, it's the year 2045. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like- <laughs> He just kept popping all <laughs> yeah. the little bubbles. Like, literally everything you thought you knew was completely freaking wrong. Mm-hmm. 
So after this bombshell, Mm -hmm. uh, they Emma, being the optimist she is, is thinking, oh, shit, we can just get to the other world Mm -hmm. and we'll be fine. So we just have to to get there and then we we will still have to go back and get everybody else, which, again, (sighs) I, I appreciate her good heartedness. I, I appreciate it so much, but it, it when you think of the logistics of it, you're just like Emma. You, there's a lot going on here. We still gotta go back, especially and, considering. I'm pretty sure she said that they left with 15 of the older children. So there's still like 20-something of the children there because there was an original number of 37. Yeah. So you still have 20-something children to rescue from your house on top of the other five houses that probably have 30-plus children ranging from, you know, let's say at least 10 down to infancy. Yeah. And that's not even including where these babies are born and the nursery type system that the demons would have set up before these babies ever even come to live at the houses. Sure. Because it's like by the time the babies come to live to the house at the houses, they're at least I would say at least six months old. They're not newborn newborns. No. Absolutely not. But at least six months old, it closer to a year, if anything. Mm-hmm. But you never really get to see many interactions with the babies other than, like, I think two scenes, really. Yeah. But you're talking about 15 adolescent children trying to rescue upwards of a hundred other children. Yeah. That don't even know these kids or the demons exist. Because that's the other part of it, too. They're still hell-bent on rescuing all of the fucking children from all the fucking yes. farms and they only knew about the few and yeah, they only knew about the five farms that were connected to theirs not but, the fact that there are literally like hundreds of others yeah and that's that's the other thing that he he laid out is like no yeah. there are so many so many and yeah. now i don't remember if they showed the map there like they were because I felt like when they were discussing it, they showed kind of how the, the world was split. But it didn't seem like a fair split. It almost seemed like the humans got kind of like this sliver off to the side on the east. And then everybody, well, the demons got the rest of the west. I think it was that sliver off to the side wasn't so much to show like how it was split. Um, That's where he was saying there was like an outpost where somebody gotcha. could help them because that's where that's where the gate would be mm. or at least closer to there. Now, before did they learn about that that out Yeah, they learned, yeah, they about, about, that learned about that outpost in the bunker. Because they were looking on a map and they were just like here we are and then Here's where he wants us to go. And it was like, my God, that's just so far. Yeah. (laughs) And you're just looking at it like, yeah, that is kind of a trek. But they were just like, no, we'll we'll manage it. We'll figure it out. We'll we'll get there. Yeah, that's when um, I think it's after they talked to him that they realize like that's where the gate would have to be to go to the human side or at least somewhere close to there would have to be where the gate is to go to the human side. Mm -hmm. So now their plan is to get there, check it out, make sure they can get across, then go back and get all the fucking kids and get all the way back over there. (laughs) And it's so long. There's so much. Like it's not with just like driving a car. Children. Yes, with all That's these children. That's the biggest thing cuz they don't have any mode of transportation. You n- don't see any mode of transportation outside of the ho- the demon horse. Yeah, they're that, they're uh, like I've Sanju, not seen Is that what you said his name was? Yeah, Sanju. Yeah. Sanju, outside of the horse that Sanju rides. But even even later on, yeah, when, when we kind of see like the city, we don't see cars. We don't see any kind of mode of transportation. And this is 2045. (laughs) We should see vehicles of some sort. But see, that's the other thing. Because even though it's 2045, like, 
the clothing, the technology is all at least from what the 40s, 50s. Seems like it. So it makes you wonder because the way that they make it seem and the way that Sanju made it seem to the kids is even if you get there, what if the humans don't let you come? Sure. Because they have a standing agreement with the demons. So they're basing this whole thing off of human empathy, even though humans are the ones that made this deal. Because Sanju even tells them when they were fighting, the you know, the demons ate the humans. And then it was, well, the humans started fighting back and started killing the demons to the point where they almost killed them off. So they struck up a deal. Hey, we'll let you live. Just give us some of your people so we can breed them and we'll just leave you and all the rest of humanity alone. And that makes you wonder how that deal went down. Like, who got sacrificed and were they willing participants? Because I cannot imagine a fucking human being. They would have been like, I'll go. Well, <laughs> you yourself probably wouldn't be eaten, but you would have to live knowing that every single person from your bloodline would be eaten. Yeah, fuck that. All I, of your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, so on and so forth. Now, if I knew that my bloodline was terrible, which, you know, some of them are, but <laughs> I'm just... I still don't know if I could willingly be a participant in that choice. Like, like, it makes you wonder if it was almost like, and no offense to Australia, but their original origins were a prison sure. colony. So it kind of makes you wonder if it was like that. They just took the worst of them and sent them. But then you also have to wonder, how many did they leave behind? Because eventually you would think if they left, say a hundred of them behind hmm. there's only so many combinations before you start hitting some type of inbreeding whether it's third fifth whatever cousins you're still going to be crossing those over but how many farms do we have and how many crossbreeds can we do because well, that's what i'm saying the original number that they left behind would have been the only humans that stayed but here's here's the other part of it that i'm, I'm throwing out there mm -hmm. is we like from the male from the female perspective we see mm -hmm. the the women become mothers as uh, it were yes if they are if selected. they are chosen if yes. they're selected so where are the men you cannot breed without the men unless you were just forgive forgive the the, <laughs> the <laughs> picture i'm about to paint but you're just jerking them off and getting their semen and setting it aside in cryo tanks or whatever and then you're just using that to inseminate the women and see i don't even know if they ever explain that part because like, that's, that's a they crucial do? detail yeah like how do they get these women pregnant because you we know of at least well no we know of several human men because all of the ones that attack the bunker seem oh. to be men and then we know that um Dr. Minerva mm -hmm. was a man. And then we know his assistant is the one that gave Corona or Crona huh. the um the pen. Why are you always had, trying to make her? Uh... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but gave dropped the pen so she would find it and everything else. Right. So Which came in very handy, by the way. Yes, and there are other men when you later find out about the experiments and the children that had to undergo those experiments. So we know there are human men, but they seem to be working specifically with the demons. So at that point, you're kind of like, well, what are the criteria for you to become something like that and not get eaten? Because all we've seen is a way out for women yeah. Or, well, for girls. But even then, not all of those girls fucking become mothers. And so do they just get eaten? You feel like they have to be very selective about that because you can't consume them all because you need breeders. Exactly. But if every mother then is the only one that's breeding with them, where are all the other kids coming from? Yeah. Because 
again, based on the information that we have, using Isabel or Isabella as a as a a case point or yeah. even Krona for that matter, they both had a child. Yep. They became a sister or a mother, mm-hmm. and that's it. So if they're not breeding anymore, where are the other children coming from? There's got even if you have so many farms, you mm-hmm. still only have one mother and say maybe one sister to assist. But you're still having to have children. So where are the other children coming yeah. from? Because they are going to end at some point. Yeah. So like you said, is it who are siblings, who are not? Where's the incest coming in? We don't know. There's a lot of questions that this is raising. And I genuinely hope that should we ever get the chance to read the manga, mm-hmm. some of this will kind of put it, be put into context for, for us to understand. Because right now... I didn't think about it until you really brought this up. <laughs> but now that I'm putting it in context, it's like, Christ, yeah, there's a lot of questions that are being raised here. Well, so, yeah, because like, I even sit there and thought, well, how I had made the comment about the boy that Isabella was, uh, I won't, I don't want to say sweet on, because they're raised like siblings. But there's no denying that Emma and Norman, that especially Norman has a love for Emma that I just feel like isn't sibling-esque. Well, I mean, think about it, okay? If you know from a genetic standpoint, yeah, this is not someone you're related to, yeah. then I think a part of your brain shuts off and is like, I can be attracted to this person. I felt like if there was any semblance that mm-hmm. they felt... That they were related. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that it never happens, but I'm just saying that I feel like if they knew they were related, mm-hmm. it would probably stay a little as as platonic as possible. Yeah. But knowing that they're just like random kids that are just thrown together, despite being raised as siblings, I it's not something you can really help. No, I know. know, and I'm not saying anything bad about it, but the boy that Isabella grew up with and taught her the song. Hmm. I remember making the comment to you that I kind of wondered if he was related to Norman. Sure. Because even though he looks different, he has pink hair instead of white hair, and I'm pretty sure their eyes are different colors, but it's just his personality. Right. And like, yeah, I'm sure a lot of kids have the same type of personality and, an, you know, in a way. It just, I don't know, it makes you wonder, like, who are these children's parents? Is Emma's mother an actual mother of another one of these plants? Because we know Ray is Isabella's son, but who's Ray's father? Does Isabella even know who's Ray's father is? Do the men who are in the demon's army and shit, are they the ones that impregnate the mothers? But then how do you... Because you're wanting children that are going to have superior intellect. So then it also makes you wonder, were the people that were originally left behind some of the smartest people? Because you want to breed superior intellect. So you're not going to give them all the invalids. (laughs) Mm. It it kind of makes me think, and I know you've not seen the movie, but... I kind of want to show you the movie, but I feel like you'll be bored. (laughs) 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 But... The breeding process, if they were to do it in a certain way, I, it almost make me think of uh, Rosemary's Baby because how all that kind of went down, mm-hmm. how Rosemary herself became pregnant almost seemed like a dream state, like mm-hmm. something she wasn't 100% sure was actually real or happening and... That could be a way to kind of lull them into a sense of like, oh, is this actually real? Until you see, oh, shit, I'm pregnant. Well, here's kind of a good one, too. And it pulls at something that's more modern day. Handmaid's Tale. Sure. Out of all the handmaids and everything else who are able to have babies, and those babies are able to grow up and become wives. Or, you know, the the boys that grow up, whatever in the hell they become. And then, again, breeding. Are they making sure they're not taking... One handmaid could have 
10 plus kids. Mm -hmm. So are you making sure that none of these half siblings are growing up, getting married and going off to make babies of their own? (laughs) Because that seems like a very intricate system. Sure. That you would have to know and keep track of every single one of them to make sure that there's no inbreeding. Because eventually it's going to fucking happen. No matter what, it's going to happen when you only have one specific control group because you're not it's not like they started out with 50 humans and then all of a sudden brought over 50 new humans from the human side onto the demon side once they threw up the barrier that was it the humans that were in the demon side stayed so you can't tell me there's no fucking inbreeding (laughs) if they've been doing it for a thousand years And I say this as someone who grew up in Smith County, Tennessee, where it seemed like every person I met was some form of cousin. Literally. (laughs) I'm not even joking. (laughs) Literally. So, yeah. Even. Fuck. (laughs) Even if it's uh, distant, it's still a fucking cousin. You're like, God damn it. (laughs) That's uh, funny enough. Our oldest daughter, she married her husband Jordan and when we got to you know talking with Jordan the first time I noticed his last name and I was like oh my god the man who is basically my grandfather for most of my life has that same last name and then turns out it's his fucking uncle (laughs) again no blood relation no no blood like we had to we had to clear this because we even had this issue yes Katrina and I Because we found out we share certain relatives, but we are not blood related. It just happens that I guess my family and her family like each other. (laughs) And we just always seem to be attracted to each other. So we come together. It only crosses in two spots. Ours is a great what? Still. Was it, who was it? Your. My great uh, uncle or my great aunt? No, your great uncle yeah. married one of my pa's sisters. Sisters or nieces or something. Yeah. Whatever it may be. Somebody from my pa's uh, side of the family. There's there's <laughs> marriage in there and yeah. as soon as we found out it was like, oh shit. And then we we, we did some checking and we're mm-hmm. like, okay, so there's no blood relation, it just happens to be by marriage. Mm-hmm. Same with Jordan. It's all a blood that's the whole point of being this small damn town. Exactly. You know, don't date beep if you live in a small town where your entire freaking family is from cuz when we say if you look up Smith County Tennessee it's not a big county no it doesn't have any big ass towns in it but i guarantee you if we did an ancestry test of everybody in Smith County they'd be related to either me or Stephen probably <laughs> except for Al Gore he's from Carthage Tennessee and he developed the internet he wasn't related to me, but my pa knew him See? and his daddy. He is her, her fucking pa knew Elvis Presley. <laughs> no, my grandmother. Her knew grandmother. Elvis Presley. Oh, sorry, but still, they knew Elvis Presley and his fe- fucking family. Yep. How awesome is that? I could have known the king, but oh. I didn't. He died. I was gonna say, <laughs> son of a bitch. What's but wrong yeah, with you? My pa used to go to o- over to Al Gore and Al Gore Senior's house right outside of Carthage. And we, I've, I've passed by that house many a time mm-hmm. growing up when I was a teenager because... Juniors or seniors? Did you ever pay attention to seniors' house? Going through Elmwood, mm-hmm. there's a big house sitting up on top of it. Well, I wouldn't even call it a hill. It was just kind of off to the side. It was very fancy on a big piece of land. The one that's over the river? Mm, you no. Cro- it's right... Senior's house is a big white fucking house. No, it's a brick house. Oh no, that's that's Junior's. Yeah, yeah. He he his house is the one that I passed very many times. Mm-hmm. Not to bring her up, but uh, my ex wife used to live in <laughs> Elmwood, and I would always have to pass Al Gore Junior's house to get to her parents' house well, where she lived. Then you were also passing Seniors because as soon as you get over the bridge and you see Junior's, Seniors is behind you on the cliff and it literally overlooks the river that you just passed over on that bridge. And it's a big ass white freaking house with 
big fucking windows. I may have. I, I don't remember. It's a gorgeous house. I didn't know it was his for the longest time until dad had told me about it. I just knew about juniors. I didn't yeah. pay attention to I always to knew about else. juniors. Me and Paul stopped there several times. Anyway, <laughs> we got <laughs> and off no, topic. I never got to meet Junior. <laughs> no, we're just talking about the internet because I developed it because I'm Al Gore. <coughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, I don't do a very good Al Gore. Uh, so, uh, kind of going back to the episode a little bit, one thing that I felt like would it felt like it would be a very important part to the story, and maybe it is in context to the manga. Mm -hmm. but I don't feel like it really had a, much of an impact because it felt like it was going to, mm -hmm. and maybe it does in the last half of the series, but mm -hmm. still don't think so, is when Emma asks Sanju to take her out hunting because she was like, you know, we're going to be out here. We're going to be having to do all this stuff. I have to learn how to hunt. Mm -hmm. I need to learn how to kill something. Because we can't live off of berries and grass and whatever the shit. So, and I've, it wasn't just about that too. She needed him to teach her how to kill and specifically how to kill demons. And, and, and he knew that. Yeah, he he <laughs> kind of was wishy. Well, I don't want to say wishy washy. He was elegant about how he talked to her about it because I think yes. he knew. He knew what she was trying to imply, but mm -hmm. she was very insistent. It's like, no, I gotta, I gotta hunt for them because you know we gotta have meat, we gotta have all this stuff. So I just, well, I want to make sure that I know how to do it. And then he take, he's like, all right, fine. So he takes her out into the woods, and uh, I think it was some birds, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Something like that. So he was aiming her, or pointing her some birds, and says, all right, so you know, take a shot, see what you can do, trying to help her understand how to take an aim because they got bow and arrows now, mm -hmm. and. She takes her shot. She she hits a bird, and didn't kill it. No. And this was this put some context, which I appreciated because we never really saw what this meant. So yeah. when we first saw Connie, she had a flower sticking out of her body. Yes, and I think we even saw the same out of Krona too, where mm -hmm. we just saw the flower. You know, sticking out of uh, her chest, their chest, where your heart would be. And when I said something about it. I said it was like, what is the, with the roses or something like that? You're like, no, it's not roses. Mm -hmm. But again, I didn't know yeah. because they didn't contextualize anything. So here we see Shanju be like, take this plant. And he mm -hmm. explains what it is. He said, just stick it in. He's like, I know it's going to be rough, but stick it in. And what it's going to do is it's going to absorb all the blood out of the body and mm -hmm. it's going to preserve the meat so it can last longer. And Emma understood it. Like you could see, she understood the need to do it. But when she did it, she, she had a reaction because it was, she had to just jab it in. So she, she realized in that moment that that's exactly what happened to Connie yeah. and, and, uh, Norman. Well, yeah. And <laughs> to all of her siblings. Yeah. Everybody that she's ever known, she yeah. she's now had to contextualize this is what happened to them. So it just kind of a visceral reaction to yeah. that. And it's also a religious thing with the demons because he does say, while it is practical in the sense of it drains the blood and preserves the meat, it's religious in the sense of if the flower blooms. Because when you first see it, it looks like grayish, like it's yeah, dead. Yeah. I'd say it had a little white in it. Eh, maybe whitish. Anyway, it it's not some pretty flower. And they right. are pretty flowers. But it's not but, like what you see when it's done. Exactly. Um, but he makes the comment of if it blooms, then that means like the gods have blessed you know, this food and that it's good and you can eat it. Mm -hmm. So of course the flower blooms, but he even says, um, because Emma does ask, um, you know, if it hurts it because right. she was scared that Connie must've been so scared and she must've hurt so much and all this stuff. And Sanji does reassure her and says, you know, that while it does seem cruel, what the demons do, 
they do give thanks and that they appreciate the meat and that she did not suffer. Sure. And while it's still not right, I believe it does give Emma a little more insight into it in the sense of it's not just they're being slaughtered just senselessly. Mm. Like these demons do have their own type of customs. And while it's wrong in the sense, because we're humans, you wouldn't think it's wrong if it was pigs or chickens or cows or anything like that. And that's literally how they view us. Right. And I don't know. It's a beautiful moment, but it's so heartbreaking too. (laughs) It's a little hard to contextualize as a human being. (laughs) <laughs> because you're like, oh, okay, so that's fine that you're eating humans and just because you do yeah. the thanks and with the flour and whatnot. Because you're happy and you pray and you say thank you for this meal. Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's fine. Would you feel the same way if the roles were reversed? Yeah. <laughs> Which you even find out there's a character who reverses yeah. those roles. <laughs> so let's get to that. So essentially from that point on, they, they, I mean, what Sanju and Mujikai do is they, they pretty much take them through this deep tunnel. Yes. Through the forest land or whatever that they were trying Safely. to go, traverse. Mm-hmm. But it's underground. To our understanding, no one knows about it but them. That's what mm-hmm. Sanju says. He's like, no one knows about this, so you don't have to worry about it. We'll take you through. Mm-hmm. They get them to the end. They say, now here is a wasteland. <laughs> and leading up to that point, they did teach them survival skills. Yeah. They taught them what herbs would keep, you know, what herbs were good to eat, what herbs to stay away from, what was good for medicine. They even um, helped them gather the, the, there's a plant that they find that has water in them. Yeah. And they help them because the kids, when they first find them, they're like, oh, and they slit them open and drain all the water out of them. Well, they go on to teach them, hey, you can harvest these whole plants and just take them with you. So you're not having to just kill them and drain all the water. You just pluck them and take them with you. Plant more. Keep seeds. They gave them seeds to plant. So they helped them a lot. (laughs) They They did. did a lot of things to help them and keep these children safe. However, when they get to the edge and yeah. they they yeah. show them, here's the desert wasteland. If you just keep going south, you're going to wind up where you need to be. And they're like, great, that's fantastic. We'll get there. Now, remember, they got that pin that's showing them coordinates. That's yes. how they've been trying to track where they're going because they have very specific coordinates where they're going. So they've been using that pin, which has little kind of points out where they are. Yes. And they're like, all right, so... We've got it. We know where we're going. We're going to head there. Great. See you guys later. Now, they give uh, Emma an amulet to kind of remember <coughs> them by, as it were. Well, um, Mujikai? Mujikai gives her an amulet and tells her it will protect her. Sure. And then as they leave, uh, this is where things take a turn. <laughs> and Sanju seems like he's uh, kind of getting a getting a hankering for some human flesh and starts going on this rant how oh we'll let them go out there and they'll breed and they're gonna have so many humans out there and then we can feast upon their flesh because they're gonna they're just gonna breed like wildfire out there but we're gonna just eat them all whenever you know they get the harvest out there yeah i so- think it was more of it gives them a fighting chance while also giving him the thrill of a hunt. I guess it was just not to mention you kind of see which granted, we don't know the position that both of them were in before they went away from the demon teachings and shit. But we know that they're in hiding from other demons. Sure. We know that they don't seem to like the other demons because Sanju even goes out specifically to go after the one demon that's after the kids and he kills the other dog demons. Yeah. So you don't really know what they're standing on or standing is and everything else, but you can kind of see the face that Mujika makes of kind of (sighs) like. She seems a little distressed by it. Yeah. 
Like, she's not too happy to hear him saying it, but at the same time, you learn a little later on when they get to the city that not every demon gets to eat good quality meat. Sure. Like, a lot of the kids get chopped up and sold to these, you know, lesser demons and stuff like that, and then... You know, they're getting, like, fingers and toes and arms and legs, but they're not getting the good meat, which is the brains and all that kind of crap. Mm. So, it just kind of makes you wonder, is it a whole, like, well, we've been in the lower tier for so long that finally we're going to get some good meat. Finally, we're going to be able to survive. The little people in the sense of the lower class demons are finally going to have food. Or is it just a, he's a hunter, and it's all about the catch and the kill for him. Well, I mean, but he also wants them to grow. That's the thing. He's not specifically because he could have killed every damn one of them if he wanted sure. to multiple times. He could have waited for him to get out there and went out and slaughtered every single one of them. But he didn't. He helped him. He taught him. He it genuinely seems like he wants them to grow up. He doesn't want to hurt these specific children, but their children or their children's children. Or fair game. And we do kind of get context to that as well. So we've kind of mentioned the bunker thing. Once they get out into the wasteland, they find the bunker. It took them a minute to, to kind of track it down because it was hidden under a rock and there were some riddles and bullshit and whatnot. They get in there. They, they find that everything is set up for them to live comfortably. Like mm-hmm. everything they want, food, water, energy, a way to even grow their own food, what have you, but they still had to to make some concessions when it Mm -hmm. came to hunting. So where Emma had learned to hunt, she would go out and she'd try to hunt some birds or what have you. And then she took some of the other kids. They had found these. uh, Slimy slugfish. (laughs) Yeah. Slugfish. That'd be the best way to put it. Cause they look like fish, but they also look like slugs. And they looked at him and they were just like, do you think that would be okay? And then there was this whole thing where they, <laughs> like, they gathered up a ton. And you're sitting there thinking, if you don't know if it's going to be worth eating, maybe take one, uh, cook it, try it, and then then feed it to everybody. But they cooked up a fucking feast of them. And they yeah. were just like, should we eat it? Should we eat it? And it's like, what are you doing? Just at least try it first and then get on with it. But... Luckily, to our understanding, there was no <laughs> negative. Uh, no, they're perfect with hunting. Yeah, so <laughs> whatever these slugfish were, they ate it. <laughs> they they did like a, a poison test and waited a few minutes to see if there was any adverse reactions. <clears throat> By poison test, it was Ray who ate the first fish yeah. to wait and see if he died. <laughs> or had any kind of adverse reactions. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, there was none. And then the rest of the, everybody just starts eating them. So... And the beauty of that was is that there seemed to be an abundance of these oh, yeah. slugfish or whatever they called them just everywhere, so they were easy to find. I think Maybe they not. called them like snotfish or something. Something like that, because they were slippery. <laughs> but they were not very easy to catch because they were very slippery like a fish would be. Yeah. But they survived off of that eventually because of Ray's stupidity. <laughs> uh, the demons and their whole crew found out where they were at come in barrel in and of course they they bail now when the end of that episode happens when we get back to them after the end of that episode once they Mm -hmm. get out of the bunker that's where we have another time jump which seems to be what we say about the six month to a year Mm -hmm. it was at least six months because they had officially been out of um i think they call it plant four or whatever Mm -hmm. But they officially have been away from the house for a year. Yeah. And I think Emma makes the comment of we've been doing this, you know, for six months. And they still have some of their stockpile from when they were with um, the demons. Right. And even during, I, I don't know if this has happened within the last three episodes we watched. Because I feel like that was around... First three were them getting to the bunker and then getting chased out. I, I'm almost positive. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in all this, we get as we get a like a snapshot of Isabella, mm-hmm. where she's still locked up. Yeah, she's in prison, and it almost kind of seems like they're they're 
kind of giving her the guff, just being like, uh, you know, you screwed up. You shouldn't have done that. And we're going to, we're going to have to take care of it. And then eventually a deal comes around where it seems like they want to try and mend some fences, but with some caveats, a big fucking caveat, which tell me that. Cause I, I can't remember the specifics of it. The head demon, which, uh, well, I say the head demon, but he's just the demon we have seen with grandmother and with Isabella and was the one that was out in the woods. Right. Um, he gives Isabella the option of dying. He presents her with one of the flowers and basically tells her you can die or you can have this option because it's been a year and this prime meat has just disappeared and they can't find it. So they tell Isabella if she doesn't want to die, do does she think she could retrieve all 15 children? Hmm. And Isabella says yes. And they tell her, well, if you retrieve all 15 children and bring them to us intact and undamaged, then we will let you go. And she's kind of like, let me go. What do you mean? And he's like, we will remove the device from your chest and you will be free. Hmm. You can go to the human side. You can live out the rest of your days. Just bring us these children. And Isabella agrees. Yeah. Now, okay, so I wanted to clarify. It was the last two episodes we watched that were hmm. within that. Uh, so just for clarity's sake, I just wanted to bring that up. But during that time when we kind of get reacquainted with the kids, mm-hmm. probably around episode five when time has passed, Kind of see some changes in them where they look like they've grown a little bit. And Emma's yeah, got like some a little. Some of them have longer hair. Yeah. And she's got like a little shady. Padawan braid and shit mm-hmm. going on. But we're also getting to see the demons and how they yes. live. And they have their whole society because mm-hmm. we didn't know about this. You know, we're just hearing shit from the one side of it. Now we see that there's whole towns full of them. Mm-hmm. And they are struggling in the same way. Now we don't quite necessarily understand how exactly at first Mm -hmm. because we saw i remember there was like a family or something like that and i didn't quite understand what was going on but you saw like a a child who was just look i don't even know how to describe it just not normal looking well you know i will say a lot of the demons don't look as pretty as sanju right but this one looked very sickly and just kind of uh bulbous like well he is like a a, like a worm type i guess but uh yes you see a family of two older brother demons and their two younger sibling demons Mm. and there's a little boy and a little girl and they're basically laying in bed and are super sick and can barely move and everything like that and the older demons are talking about how they need to get some good meat and i think they brought home like a hand was all they could afford and they start talking about how you know they wonder if they can catch the one children that escaped and they've been living out and they think that they're close by here and all this kind of stuff but you can see it like uh i don't know it like shows the humanity of some of these demons <laughs> because while they are talking about wanting to eat children it's literally because of what you end up finding out which is that the demons that don't get the high quality meat start to degenerate right. and demons that aren't able to eat human meat at all degenerate into what you see in the woods the big bulbous creepy fucking monster that's just mindless mm-hmm. So they're literally trying to save their baby siblings, which is no different than what Emma is trying to do with all hers. And it's so messed up. But I appreciated <laughs> that conflict because when you when you see it from her side and you I mean we 100% agree, 100% mm-hmm. are with Emma and <clears throat> and her goal and her quest because like, yeah, fuck that. They're eating children. 
We're not yep. going to have that. And then when you see it from the other side, because if you think about it, the people that they are running from are, are they're the rich. They're the mm-hmm. high end quality, you know, they top of the line. They're the top dogs of this demon pyramid. Mm-hmm. And then now we're getting to see them like from the other side, if you think about it, like mm-hmm. their reflective sides. And while you, <laughs> you don't, agree with them eating children yeah what other options do they have because when you find out that they become what the the mindless creatures they even say that whatever they consume they kind of take on those traits and they become those things but why wouldn't you want to become human why wouldn't you be want to become something like that yeah something that's an intellectual right so it it causes real conflict because you're trying to understand it from the other side and it's hard because you are human and I, but you mm-hmm. can understand the plight that they're going through because they can't help the situation they're in they can't help who they are yep. this is just how they live and this is what they got to do so it's no different than what they're doing. They want to survive too. This is what they got to do. So what do you do? And I don't know. I, I'm I'm not saying I was I turned a heel and was like, oh yeah, I'm on the demon side now. Nothing like that. But it complicates everything to the point where you can't pick and choose because it's like, well, shit. I will say there is another episode in the next few that we will watch that I felt like, especially for me, complicated it even more. Okay. <laughs> but as they were out in town, Emma, for some damn reason, there were these two little kids, and I cannot remember their name, but they it started when they were back at the bunker. They was like, hey, we want to go out and help hunt and whatnot. And they were like two little, like, Two peas in a pod, a dynamic duo, and I can't remember their names. Let me see if I can look up their names. A black-haired boy and a little blonde. gap-toothed blonde boy. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, he grew in his tooth when he got a little older. Well, but I will say, which you didn't touch on this, these children aren't just walking around the fucking demon town. No, no, no. <laughs> without disguises. <laughs> right, no. They had disguises. They, they had this whole situation where Emma and Ray had kind of... Not only did it had masks, but they even had a way to mask their scent because that was another thing that was very complicated about the whole thing is that the demons could smell them. So they had to find a way to mask their scent so they could walk around freely. And they were essentially going around collecting what food they could secretly so no one was actually paying attention to them so they could bring it back to the other kids so they could feed them. And while they were out there one time, they took the two little boys who, again, I'll give them credit. They were the ones who came up with the snot fish. They are Lannon and... Is it Thoma? Thoma? They show him pictures? Yes. I mean, you should be able to tell with his stupid little well, eyes grin. Well, that's the thing. It's the pictures from the anime. Uh... Well, that's what you should know it from. <laughs> Not the anime, the manga, the uh, second row. Uh, kind of looks like him, yeah. Or I would say so, maybe. If that's, that's not them, correct like. us. All right. Well, that's definitely uh, Lannon. Definitely looks like the little blonde kid <laughs> with the funky ass looking hair. Anyway, and these are the escapees, so it would have to be one of the two of them, or those two of them anyway they're anyway, the ones that go with them yeah they they're the ones that discovered the snot fish so i'll mm-hmm. give them credit for that but they wanted like the reason they even found them in the first place is because they begged to go hunting and emma was like all right fine you can come but don't be screwing with anything and then now they started up again it's like oh, we want to go out and we want to help and we can we can help carry more back you know because you, you need more help and she was like all right fine but don't mess with anything. Just, you know, got to stick with it. Got to keep this grass on you or whatever. Keep your mask in mm-hmm. it or your scent masked. And yep. that's that. They go into town. They do fine for a little bit. And then they bump into 
two that we've been following. I think mm-hmm. they were the ones that had the siblings and yes, whatnot, right? Yes, the two demon brothers. Mm-hmm. And at first it was like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, you know. But yeah, then, they were very apologetic because they thought they were children. <laughs> right. But then they start getting that scent. I'm like, oh, ooh, what's that smell? And then it starts to become a chase because suddenly they realize, oh, shit, these are children. Well, these are real children. Both of the boys take off and... That is one thing, and how Ray realized, uh, good lord, I cannot remember her name for the life of me. Emma, or? No, the demon. Mojica? Mojica. Uh, that she was a demon because of her feet. Ah, yeah. They have apish looking feet in the sense of how their toes lay. Sure. You kind of have like the four long toes and the fifth toe that's kind of brought back a little. Mm. But... Obviously very not human freaking feet. Yeah. And when the boys take off running, the demons look down and because they're running and their little uh, disguises are kind of pulling up because they're like long dress looking robes, you can see their shoes and you can easily tell they are freaking human. (laughs) So they pretty much run them into a corner and... I was curious how this is going to play out, but damn if one of my thoughts that I knew, <laughs> I knew mm-hmm. was true, came to fruition because as they are caught down this alleyway, uh, they are rescued by Norman. Yes. Who I knew. What did I say? If you don't see a body, they're not dead. <laughs> and he was not dead. But it wasn't like he escaped or anything like that. No. Uh, he uh, gets reunited with everybody, and then they have kind of have their moments where they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe you're alive. Oh, my God. And then he brings them to his hideout, I guess mm-hmm. it would be, and introduces yes, him to- because he's not alone. <laughs> right. He introduces her or them to his new friends mm-hmm. and explains that he was taken to a facility- Mm-hmm. Where they were trying to, I guess, try to figure out what makes a good human brain perfect thing, whatever. They basically wanted to scientifically breed intellectual people so that they had more smart children to eat. Right. But luckily, him and his uh, three compatriots got away. Because... They have superpowers now. <laughs> superpowers. What are they? I don't know yet. We kind of saw the one girls, the which is who we were going to come back to. I do not remember their names, I'm but sure there is that. one of the people in their party is a girl. Mm-hmm. And she... um. Is eating this giant, what looks like a massive turkey leg. Which is what I thought it was. Yep. And then you find out that, you know, because she's like, well, if they're going to eat us, I'm going to return the favor. And she eats demons. Barbara. Barbara. Yeah. Barbara, uh, Vincent, and Cislo. There we go. And And they are all much older, by the way. Much older than Norman. If not... Very late teenagers, possibly whole ass adults. I'm not 100% sure. I don't know if they ever uh, actually say their ages, but they are definitely older. If if anything, I would say they're probably in their late teens at most. Because they, they definitely have a one up on Norman. Yeah. And I'd say at this point, he's... Well, how old was he when he, he left? He was about 12. Yeah, so, so he'd be depending about fifteen. On when his because it's been no. at least two years based on the years that we saw. No. Yeah, no. because when he left, it was close to twenty six or twenty four or twenty forty six, and it was oh. twenty forty seven, and then if six months passed, he's close to at least fifteen by now, if not fifteen. Depending on when his birthday was. Unless he was 14, 15. He's got to be there because at least two years have passed. I know he was 12 when he got shipped. 
and at least a year had passed from the time they escaped. Year and a half. Year and a half. <laughs> I'm I'm sticking with that. Based on the calendar in the bunker, it was a year and a half. But if the calendar you said, was even right. No. No, <laughs> bullshit. You don't show 2047 or 2046 or whatever the shit. It, no, it was 2047. Because when they left, it was 2046. When they got to the bunker, it was 2047. They showed that calendar. Do not show an incorrect calendar and confuse people because it didn't say that. That's where I'm standing on that. It's been at least a year and a half to two years at that point. He's at least 14 to 15. I'm sticking with that. I mean, if you say so. I'm sticking with it. I but could be wrong. the demons in the town specifically say it has been a year since those children escaped the facility. Do you think they're Bullshit. still out there? Bullshit. <laughs> Do not buy it. You're confusing everything with your stupid... Anyway... He gets back and he, like, they, uh, Norman and uh, Ray are sitting with the three new mentions that I just said Vincent, Cicelo, and Barbara. Ha -ha, no, or, Emma and Ray are sitting that's what I said. with Is that what said I said? Norman. <laughs> okay, well, Emma and Ray, that's what I meant, are sitting with them. That's when they're talking with them. That's when they see Emma eating a demon and Barbara. Or Barbara. God damn it. <laughs> There's a lot of names here. Barbara. Barbara. <laughs> they're coming to get you, Barbara. <laughs> and she is eating the demon. And, of course, they're freaked out by it. Now, when you listen to them talk, Barbara definitely has a chip on her shoulder. Mm. And she explains, you know, if they're going to eat us, I'm going to eat them. And that's pretty much where she leaves it. Now, the other two, Cicelo and Vincent, they're just like, hey, you know, whatever. They seem like they're just kind of... You know, just going with the flow, whatever. But they talk about Norman. And it's like, oh, this dude, he's he's on top of it. He's yeah, sharp. You the know? boss. He's the boss. You know, everything that he says, everything he does, he's smart. He's on top of it. And while I don't feel like Ray and Emma disagree with that, it's, I guess, how they're describing him, how they have seen him. Well, it's is also, where they feel a little iffy about, like, oh, is that yeah. the same guy? And also just the fact that all three, Barbara and the other two, are so much bigger than Norman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they will uh, they seem like they'll bend over backwards for him. Yeah. Because he's just like, And that's yeah. what you even find out is Norman's the reason they were able to escape the facility. Like I said, dude sharp. He's always thinking two steps ahead. I'm not surprised. But... You go to find out that Norman has basically created a compound mm. that will start to degenerate all demons. So they mm. will regress and turn into the monstrous, mindless demons and basically kill each other, leaving all the humans. So he wants to pretty much create mass genocide against the demons. And that's where Emma seems to be having the problem because... Mm -hmm. Even before she saw Barbara munching on that big demon leg, yeah, she was already being she was already having conflict. Like she's like, well, do, like she did, she understands the the issue, mm -hmm. but she also is sympathizing with their plight as well. So she's like, I don't know what to like. She's she's can't quite land on where she feels on it because she's conflicted because she wants to survive she wants everybody to survive but she also doesn't want to kill an entire race of people to do that well and knowing that mujika yeah because because there. they met someone because, yes, because they saw they met them mm -hmm. the good the good side of it and mm -hmm. i feel like had shonju shown his true colors or at least that that wrong side of him that just mm -hmm. kind of came out that might have changed but Mujika, even then, even when he was, like we said, she still seemed conflicted by it. So it's almost like you have this dichotomy of these two sides of the coin, mm -hmm. both being on the same side. Like, she doesn't want to hurt humans. Mm -hmm. Emma doesn't want to hurt demons because mm -hmm. they see both sides of it. And it creates this interesting conflict of it all. And I will say... um, 
Sanju also, he taught them how to kill demons. Yeah. He told them before they left to shoot for the eyes. Mm -hmm. That that is their weak point. So he told these children how they could kill his own kind. So that's why I still kind of feel like he's not... Which I don't know. He might be a bad person because he might have so much more information in the books than what you get in this. I don't feel like he's 100% bad. He's definitely in a gray area. Hmm. Because again, he could have killed him. He could have told, you know, the the other demons where they were. He might have told the other demons where they were. You never know because he met up with the one fucker in the woods and yet he still seemed to be alive. It's true. Never saw him fight. Never saw their discussion, you know, what they talked about. Nothing like that. Never saw any of that. So you really don't know because... Again, he helped them, he fed them, he taught them to survive, taught them how to kill his own kind. So is it just a thrill thing for him? You don't know. It's true. But just the fact that they met them gives him a pause. Hmm. And then they start thinking, well, if this is only to kill the demons that consume human flesh, what if it doesn't work on them? So they go to bring it up to Norman. And this is where I started having a problem with Norman. <laughs> was in this situation where Norman mentioned, well, Emma mentions the people that she has met, which is Sh Shojin and Mujikai. She mentions to Norman... Because Ray kind of talks her into it because Ray sees that she has a problem with Norman's plan. And Ray even says, I don't have a problem with it. But if you have a problem with it and it doesn't sit right with you, you need to say something. So Emma goes to say something and kind of starts off with, a, you know, what if <laughs> mm -hmm. they're not all bad? <laughs> And you can definitely see Norman has already 100% picked a side. Which, granted, we know that they were experimented on, uh, tortured, in a sense. We don't know to what extent, but it was enough to mess up all four of them mentally. Mm -hmm. And just the fact that they have it in them that they want to just exterminate every single demon. Knowing that there are children demons and stuff like that and we didn't even mention the old man demon that the children meet they while they're living in this abandoned temple there is an old blind demon that comes in and he thinks that they're just demon children mm -hmm. and they're playing and he even tells them you know this is holy ground you don't need to be playing in here but he never seems to be a bad person but then you don't really know what would happen if you knew that they were human either. And you do find out a little bit more about him, but you know he has a granddaughter. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see why Emma feels a certain way about him. But when she mentions uh, Mujika, or well, that they came across two demons that do not consume meat. Mm-hmm. And he asked if, you know, one of them was a girl. And, you know, him is kind of like, oh, you know her. And Norman makes the comment of, I can't believe, you know, that vile girl is still alive. And that's kind of where they yeah. end it. That was the end of our, our six episodes. Perfect ending. If you yeah. think about it. It was one heck of a cliffhanger for you. <laughs> because I was like, what? Because there was nothing about her. Even when you saw her with uh, Shojin, that she had any kind of ill intent. But yeah. again, we don't know her as well as Because she even else. chastised him for like when um, Ray and Emma first meet her in the tunnels after they wake up. She even chastised uh the other one for coming in 
because he startled them and made them, you know, feel like they were threatened because she was standing in front of them. They just called her out for being a demon. And then now here's this bigger demon <laughs> that's standing behind them. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, you know, you shouldn't sneak up on people. You shouldn't act like that. And even you can tell that she kind of watches him and listens to him, how he interacts with these children. And it's almost like she's kind of a mother hen and she doesn't really know how to feel about her rooster that's walking around. Sure. <laughs> but you can also tell that they have some kind of a relationship and they've definitely been together for quite some time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. This is definitely one of the reasons why I want to read the books because I want to know so much more about these two specific demons. I mean, I'm with you there because I did get a little curious and I, it's really hard to try and research something when you haven't finished it all. Yeah, because you I, don't want shit spoiled for you. And I'm afraid a piece of it has been, but I don't want to say anything because I don't know. It was just a picture. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything to contextualize it with, but it was a picture and I was like, oh, okay. But I just tried to put it away and be like... Don't think about it because I don't know what that Picture means. Picture from the anime or from the manga? I'm assuming it's from the anime, but I don't know that for sure. And based on some details that I read, and mm -hmm. I was trying to be very specific on what I read and didn't read because I don't, again, I don't want anything spoiled. But to my understanding, contextually what I probably saw is not what happens in the manga. Okay. So, it could be something that changed hmm. along the way to try and make the anime work within the two seasons they were trying to do versus what actually does happen in the manga. Again, all the more reason I actually want to read the manga. You know, because I've even mentioned that. Like, I know that uh, we've got Full Metal Alchemist manga <laughs> in there, and I would love mm -hmm. to read that, even though that Brotherhood does adhere closer to that mm -hmm. i'd still like to read it just to kind of get <laughs> that sense of it same with this if this is deviating so much and or cutting out large chunks because the mm -hmm. one comment i remember reading <laughs> is they just seem so fucking pissed that that whole bunker thing was condensed to essentially two episodes or yeah. something of that nature it was like, there is so much here that they took away. Like, he was so devastated. And he didn't go into details, but yeah. he made it seem like there was so much that was just wiped clean. Mm. And again, he just may have been a passionate fan <laughs> that maybe it was one little detail, but he's blowing it up into something bigger. But I don't know. And it is disappointing that if there was an entire, like something that could have been an entire season in that bunker. Yeah. And made a lot of context and a lot of details and a lot of growth for these characters that was just cut out. I'd have been pissed too. Yeah. I mean, shit. I'll even use The Walking Dead as a great example. While I appreciate that they tried to tweak some things in that show, when certain things did not happen a certain way, it w would kind of irk me a little bit because it was yeah. like, God damn it. You had a perfect way to tell the story and then you had to deviate this stupid fucking way. What are you doing? And again, I understand TV, comics, not the same, but there were just certain things that just, that's why I stopped watching it because it was like, well, I know how it ends, how it ends the way I want it to end. <laughs> the way that it actually ends is yeah. so much better than anything they could possibly come up with in the show now because they have deviated so freaking far from it. Sure. Unless they literally take that last scene from the comics or that, you know, the last part of the comics. They can't. And make it about his sister. That's the only fucking way it would work. Still don't think it could work because now they've got I that I don't new... think either because she didn't know everything from the beginning to the end like Carl did. Yeah. <laughs> and I keep hearing that this new show that just, that just came out is so awesome, mm. but... I just, no. I don't have it in me anymore, you know? I just don't have a desire for it. I, I know that there are so many people out there who want to fucking watch that shit. Go, more power to you. I just, I have lost so much interest. I have seen yeah. the end of the story that I wanted to follow, that I was following. Yeah. I read it. 
I got to my end and it's like it closed that chapter and I was like done with that story. Mm -hmm. And whatever they're doing on AMC is just like, I don't really give a shit. I don't care. You can do all your fucking spinoffs with everybody. I don't care. Even the spinoff, the character we freaking loved in it died so early and they just kept going on with it and just like, God dang it. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and they've got what three spinoffs now? They've got the one Probably. with Maggie and Negan. They got the Daryl one, and now they've got Rick and Michonne back in their own series. I again, all these characters were in the original series, and now you've spun well, except for Daryl. Excuse me. Yeah. And Carol died early on. Spoiler: If you've never read the comics, very fucking early on, by the way. Point being. <laughs> They're they're doing all these spinoffs and all these different things with all mm-hmm. these characters. And while it was fun for the time that we watched, I just don't have it in me to care anymore. No, they you lost know? my uh, love and support when they killed Jesus. It wasn't even that. It was just <laughs> all of it. It was just too much. I mean, we were trying to follow Fear the Walking Dead. And what was it? Was there another one? I feel like it was just the two, maybe, but it just got so dull and boring and shit, and I was just, did not give a damn anymore. And if you still love it, I'm not knocking you, okay? Understand that. I just, I, I could not tolerate it anymore. It was just, no. I, I've seen the story. Yeah. I know what I wanted. I got it. I'm done. I, I just, I can't, I can't deal with it anymore. No. They so, touched on a few cool stories in Fear the Walking Dead but after that it was just me. Yeah it just got so god damn like the nuclear power plant was probably my favorite entire like little arc Mm -hmm. in that but they just other than that they drug their feet yeah for a lot and so I can understand where this could be frustrating for someone who's read the material yeah and then you're just like you cut an entire arc out of this like how they botched the prison in The Walking Dead, to use another comparison. So if the bunker was that, and they just said, eh, mm-hmm. we're not going to do that. And you just condensed it to two episodes? Yeah. yeah. I'd have been pissed. Yeah. Because that, whatever that was, again, I don't know, but whatever it was, there's so much, using The Walking Dead as an example, there was mm-hmm. so much in that arc mm-hmm. that just, informed so much of the series going forward yeah and you just said nah we're gonna do this so yeah. much that justified so much in like, fact michonne's actions justified mm-hmm. in the show not really so much <laughs> in fact i'll even spoil this for you because i heard this do you know what they did in that first episode of the new walking dead spinoff with rick no. Take a guess. What was the one thing they didn't do in the original series that everyone was pissed about? Cut his hand off. Right on. And that's what they did. So now he doesn't have a hand. And it's like, but it's too late. Yeah. It doesn't matter now. <laughs> the whole purpose of the governor was to do that, to yeah. show what an asshole he was. Yeah. And now it's just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me anymore. When I read that, I laughed. Because it didn't matter to me anymore. But yeah. they're just like, look, look what we did. We cut his hand off. That's what you wanted. I was like, yeah, well, too late. Don't care. Yeah. Don't give a shit. <laughs> and it's funny, too, because in that same sense, when you go back to Glenn, when everybody thought he died under the dumpster and so many people were so angry about it for different reasons, because you had people... Who were angry about it because they thought Glenn died. Mm -hmm. And then you had the fans who were angry about it because you were like, no, that's not how he fucking dies. How dare you? And then when you find out he was alive, all the real friends were like, woohoo. And everybody else is like, woohoo. And then when he gets his head bashed in by Negan, all the real fans are woohoo. And everybody else is like, fuck this show. Fuck you. We actually had a conversation (laughs) about that today. Where someone was like, I was traumatized by that. And I was like. Like, yeah, I was too when I read the fucking comic. But you know what? I was excited to fucking see it. That's exactly what I said. I was like, look, I understand the dude was bad. But that was comic accurate and I was prepared. So I can understand where you were coming from. Yes. Because you were terrified because you didn't see that coming. I said, but I saw that coming and I was like. 
good. Yes. Like, that is one thing I will give the show. They were able to do certain scenes like that that made you like, yes, thank you. When Carl gets his freaking eye shot out, yes, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> and that, I don't know. It's, it's, it's trying to understand where... If you're reading the comics, if you're reading any material like that that gets adapted into this, Mm -hmm. I do appreciate when there are minor deviations where it can kind of keep you on your toes. Because a one-to-one comparison, you're just like, well, I read this, and I know how it's going to play out. So while it's fun to actually see it work on screen, I can understand the desire to maybe have a little twist here and there to where you're just not watching what you've already read. Yes. But at the same time, there are very important moments in these stories that you expect to happen because they are integral to the overall narrative. That is one of the things I will say, which I don't feel like in this sense, it's extremely integral to the overall narrative. But I will say with as much crap as they which I say crap, but I don't mean as the literature was crap, but as much crap as they removed from Harry Potter to make the movies. One of the biggest things that I have a problem with is one, you never, if all you've ever seen is the movies, you never find out that the whole reason Lily's sacrifice And her dying protected Harry was because Snape asked Voldemort to spare them. And Voldemort, like, gave Lily the option, I will spare you if you let me kill your child. And she jumped in front of it, killing her. They kept that out of the movie. Like, you see it, but you just assume she was in the room, Voldemort took her out, and then tried to take out Harry. They completely kept that out. Which was a big thing. Because it showed that Voldemort, however fucking evil he was, still gave Lily Potter the option to fucking live. Because of his loyal servant. And then towards the end, when Voldemort's back and everybody's gearing up to fight him. And Hermione, you know, vanishes her memories from her parents and all that kind of stuff. And Harry gets his aunt and uncle and his cousin to leave. Dudley and him have a heart-to-heart where Dudley genuinely thanks him for keeping them safe. And it's something that they did not do in the freaking movies. And it made so many people mad because you read the books and you watch these movies and Dudley's a little fucking asshole. But then at the end of the day... He finally breaks down and says thank you to the one and only person who can fucking protect them, which is his cousin, who he has been an absolute little shit to. And by removing that, I feel like you remove like a piece of the heart of the fucking story. So, yeah, if the bunker scene was something like that where you got like certain connections or certain storylines or you got to see those type of vulnerable points or whatever... There's no reason to remove it because it takes away from the story that you're telling. And that's what people want to watch is the story that they read. While it might not be be verbatim, you still don't want to take something that's 500 pages and condense it down to five. And I feel like that's what would what was happening here. Again, I don't know how long the arc was in the manga, but... The way this guy was going off, there seemed to be a lot going on. Because something tells me that room scene that we mentioned with the help would have been explained in greater detail. I would hope so. (laughs) Because, yeah, I'm I'm really surprised by that too. And it didn't contextualize to me until we were just talking about it during this episode. Because we never really did. Mm -mm. It wasn't like we could have assumed that they just knew where this bunker was going to be, but Mm -hmm. then that doesn't explain the scene where they saw the coordinates. So they didn't know. So they found out. Therefore, Mm -hmm. what were they afraid of? Why were they scribbling help all over the wall? Was there something about the guy who sent them there to begin with? 
that all this was a ruse. I don't know. Yes. I don't so, know. So many questions and so little answers. So. And I feel like definitely by the next, what, six or seven episodes that we have left, you're going to have just so many more answers or so, so many more questions. <laughs> we'll definitely jump into those. We'll definitely have to read the manga. And yes. uh, for anybody who, who may have answers right now, just hang on to them. Hang on to them, please. Mm -hmm. Let me finish the the series. And then if you want to contextualize, give me comments or anything in the next episode, just come back and, yes. and just be like, hey, all right, here's here's everything that you need to know because I'll still read it. But after seeing how it all ends, mm -hmm. if you want to give me the spoilers of the manga or whatever, I'll be glad to hear them. We'll be both be glad to hear them, just mm -hmm. to, whatever it is. Because I am curious, but I still would read it regardless. So oh, it's, yeah. it's not going to be like, Oh my God, you're spoiled so much. Don't spoil <laughs> stuff. I do have a spoiler rule, but for this, I'm, I'm, it's okay. I'm a little, uh, there's, there's some leeway. It just depends on what it is. Like, you, I'll give it, but this is, this is different. So hang on to your comments till next episode. Uh, let us finish. We will watch the, the next, I think seven episodes. Cause mm -hmm. I think this one had an extra episode for it for the season but uh we'll come back to it and uh we'll talk about it and we'll love to hear what you're saying and we'll, we'll probably talk about your comments if you drop any i know that one guy out there who liked to talk about brotherhood unless he was the, he only loved brotherhood <laughs> or whatever it was no he got he gave us a comment at the end of the conquer of shambhala that's what it was yeah. he didn't say anything for brotherhood anyway <laughs> people are so pissed. I got to admit that, too. That's another thing, too. We seem to have a lot of people who are listening on uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. And if any of you are the people who did this, I just <laughs> let yourself be known, you little cowards. Because uh, we're getting a lot of negative comment or, or ne thumbs downs on our Conqueror of Shambhala episode. I don't know what we said. What? Yeah, Why? but. Is it because. what? I don't yeah. know. I don't know because it was just they don't comment. They don't. They just thumb down, thumb down. <laughs> and it was like, where the fuck are all these thumbs downs coming from? I don't know what we said. I don't know what we said to disparage. I thought we were pretty like we said we didn't care for the way it ended, but we respected it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. If you little cowards just hide behind your little <laughs> thumbs downs. You don't want to explain yourselves but uh you know where everything's at yes you know how to leave a five-star review it really appreciate it if you would please uh and if you want to just a little bit more you can go over to patreon and help us out over there and if we ever get a good flow going over on patreon maybe we could do a lot more extra content for you people uh, that's that's the kind of the the purpose of it, and I'm trying, but you understand, I'm just one man. I can't do everything. <laughs> so, go do that if you wish. Uh, follow everything over slash inspired weeb. Links are down below. All right, my little weeds. We'll see you next time. This has been a Pencil and Paper Podcast Network production.